Welcome back. You're watching Luck on Sunday. I'm delighted to welcome as my special guest this week a man whose love of horse racing in Great Britain was fostered not only by early views of Channel 4 racing back in the early 2000s, but also a visit to Newmarket's Guineas in 2010. Fast forward a couple of years, he wasn't only sponsoring the race, he was having runners in it and winning Melbourne Cups. It's been an extraordinary journey. There have been some lows as well as highs along the way, but with the success of the European Horse of the Year, Roaring Lion, in 2018, he and his Qatar racing team are now firmly back on top and are much respected as a worldwide leader, not just in racing horses, but also in trying to breed top-class thoroughbreds as well. He is, of course, Sheikh Farhad. Althani. Sheikh Farhad, welcome to Luck on Sunday. Thank you very much, Nick. And thank you for coming in, because I, I don't think you'll mind me saying, this has been a sort of a, a long project of mine, but I don't think you'll mind me saying that some of us are morning people, <laughs> some of us aren't morning people. True, true, exactly. But uh, no, I'm glad to be here. I know it's been, you've tried to get me here for a bit, but I'm quite happy to be here now. And happy now particularly, because it seems that you're racing and breeding operation with your with your brothers is moving very much in the direction that you were probably wanting it to be moving in three or four years ago is that fair yes that's fair but as you know in any operation it takes um a long time to get to where you want and we're still i i i view us as infants in the game still and hopefully we want to be achieve much more than we have uh done to to, to date but uh, um, last year we had a great year of racing, uh, breeding as well, so hopefully we'll try and improve. Every year we try to find things that we can improve on. Yeah. Whenever there's a fresh injection of, of money into the sport, whenever the sport gets financial impetus, wherever it comes from, people are always inclined to wonder whether the people concerned are here to stay or whether they'll, be, whether they'll be gone tomorrow. I mean, you made it quite clear from an early stage that you were trying to build something. You weren't just trying to throw cash and hope that you'd get some glory back. No, but, uh, but as you know, Nick, it is a hobby sport after all. So uh, there's a lot of people that are fair enough to come in to, you know, as you said, buy, buy a few horses, spend a lot of money, um, either enjoy it or not enjoy it, ha have a winners or don't have winners. We, we didn't view it as that because we love horses. We've grown up with horses, right. me and my brothers. And the idea was always to build something for, for the future, hopefully long-term future for our generations to come. So I, I'd like to see my kids to grow up into a, um, a, a dynasty of, uh, of, uh, right. of breeding operations, of racing operations that they can take on from there. So I mentioned that you, you'd enjoyed watching racing on the, on the television when you, when you were a student in London. Yes. And you went to Newmarket. True. And loved it. Yeah. No, uh, I, I watched, I, watched um, I think my f early memories uh, racing in the UK was watching Channel 4 racing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was Cheltenham Festival. And it was um, very different to racing back home. Back home, we only had one racetrack and it was flat racing and they go... Uh, round in a circle. My dad was the leading uh, Arab uh, racehorse, Arab owner uh, in the country, so we, he won everything. <laughs> it seemed like it was that easy to do. <laughs> and then when, when I started watching <laughs> racing here and seeing all the different race courses and the uh, national hunt, we, we don't have national hunt back home. So uh, it was very, I was very curious about the whole, the, the whole industry and wanted to learn as much as possible from every angle of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think National Hunt Racing in Doha, they might, they might, str they <laughs> might struggle. To, even Andrew <laughs> Cooper, I think, would have a, would, would have a struggle with that. a lot of water. So you, it was different, but what was, it about, what was it about top class flat racing here, particularly, that started to really pique your interest? I think the quality, um, as you watch racing uh, around the world, I, I truly believe that the biggest quality is in uh, England in mm -hmm. terms of top class ra racing in England and Ireland, uh, particularly England. As, you, as you've seen Aiden and the, the Coolmore operation, all of them target the classics here with their best horses. I think it gives them, um, it's, it's, a, it's a good for the breed. It shows the best, um, best horses to breed onwards. Um, and generations on, you'll see that British horses, uh, the, the, the classics in Britain, always prove to be the best um, source of that. Well, we were talking before the break, and I said to James, I'll, I'll ask Sheikh Fahad this very question, because you've had grade one winners 
around the world. You race horses in the United States, in Australia very successfully. I saw you had an important winner in New Zealand. Yes, our first uh, stakes winner in New Zealand uh, was yesterday, which was quite... Uh, and that horse uh, finished second in the Irish Guineas. Mm. We had him when he finished second in the Irish Guineas. He lost his way for a few years, but he's back back as, as best now. So the obvious question is, can British racing, in your eyes, rest on its prestige and reputation alone, or is it going to have to start digging in and getting supporters like you paid what they think they should get paid for stakes races? I completely think that it can't. It, it, if, if you think it's going to sustain itself this way, then we have a problem, because it won't. It needs to, it needs to um, up its game. It needs to find ways to um, attract more people into the sport. At the moment, as uh, we're very uh, grateful that Sheikh Mohammed is in the business, as you've rightly said, the breeze ups without Sheikh Mohammed this year would have been a disaster for a lot of people. Uh, the, the, the thing is that I think British racing needs to find um, more ways to, to attract, uh, attract um, quality. I think quality is very important. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at, uh, let's, for instance, Japanese racing, they've got a two-tier system. They've got the JRA and the NRA, which is the JRA is the t elite class of uh, racehorses and racing. And if you don't break, I think, your maiden uh, as a three-year-old, uh, that horse is not allowed to run in the JRA anymore. They have to go to down to the uh, NRA level. Why can't that something can be explored that way around in British racing as well? Because we can't be racing, uh, I think you're asking people to race for two grand or three grand or even our big handicaps are, uh, are for 80 grand sometimes uh, or 100 grand when they have Saturday races in Australia worth a minimum of 100,000 per race. And in America, American maidens are worth, what, 100 grand, yes. 80 grand? In New York, yeah. Uh, and California as well. We've got, I've got horses in California, in New York, and uh, it's, it seems ridiculous if, you ju if you're just a, if you're taking a business point of view of uh, racing and you open your books, it would be ridiculous to have horses here in comparison to there if you can. But the only reason we're racing here is for the um, quality and prestige that we have at the moment. But I think that can't, uh, you can't rest on that. You have to change it. So, in essence, even though we know that racing has issues financing itself in this country, you would get around that by distributing the prize money upwards rather than the, rather than the argument that says you have to reward the grassroots first. Yes, but it's, it's, it seems funny enough that winning, a, I think if you take a horse to Newcastle or or saddle or somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't know the exact figures. I won't. But it's like two thousand or a thousand pounds to the winner, or something like that. Sometimes, uh, if you're traveling a horse all the way up there and back, is that really uh, worth it? Uh, for the quality, for the quality of the sport, for the generations to come mm -hmm. in racing, uh, I think w I definitely think that uh, quality is very important and uh, it should be rewarded more personally think because it will help the uh, it will help the sport going forward the generations to come that's my point of view of uh, what needs to happen but how uh, but I, I get the arguments that grassroots grassroots racing is important as well for you know I, I, I understand if you if, if you're a small owner you need you, you'd like that is there sh should be should there be two tier systems should there be something that's looked at like the, the way they do it in Japan. Mm -hmm. I know that the Japanese um, uh, prize money is a lot f through their uh, tort system that goes through it, but they do have two systems as well. They have the JRA and the N NRA. Um, I, I can't tell you how to how to what's best to do. We, sp as you know, we sponsor the uh, and when we sponsor, we, s we try and sponsor the big race. Our big day mm -hmm. is the uh, Champions Day, and that's one thing. I, when I came in first, as you know, you you do the Breeders' Cup. I came into British racing, and I, my first question is, what's the end day? And I was told there's nothing to, there's no finale to, like one day of mm. uh, a finish of a big celebration of uh, the end of racing. And when the idea came about, I, w I think my brothers and I were, we jumped on it. And I think, as you've seen, Champions Day has gone, gone uh, forward day, year, in, year on year. As sponsors, mm -hmm. rather than as owners, but as sponsors of that day in that series, have you had your money's worth? Uh, or, y yes, in terms of, uh, it's, not, it's not a financial thing, but in terms of, 
is it worth uh, it? It's, it's not, yes, it's not, uh, it's not money worth, it's, it's worth for the sport. Mm -hmm. I think we've done something for the sport to go forward that uh, was, d uh, was d needed. Uh, what's your point of view of Champions Day? I think the day has worked really well. I would like them to use the contingency track if the ground gets really soft. I agree with you. I, heard, I think, um, but I think the day has worked very well, and they've done very well upgrading the races. And, they, and because the money's there, and yeah. because you've put the money in, you see, for example, John Gosson, who now trains your horse or horses, putting his best horses in yeah. in these races, and he's led the way in Sir Michael Stout, likewise, and, and it hasn't detracted and, from the Breeders' and Cup. And he's done that before. We've had horses with John. Absolutely. There. Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree with yeah. you more. Where I think there's an issue is with British Champion Series, because I'm not sure the series concept has ever really taken hold, and I'd be interested to know how you see that going forward. I, I think you're absolutely right, really. Uh, for us, our main view is Champions Day. Mm. Uh, the, the series... It was an idea that was started, uh, but I don't think it's really grasped what uh, what they thought it might grasp uh, in terms of, uh, at, at the end of the day, you don't have to qualify. It's not like the all-weather races yeah. where you qu have to qualify to run on the final day. It's, it has nothing to do with that. It's, uh, Champions Day is the best horses from around the world that, wants to, that want to run are allowed to run. You don't have to have won a middle series or a sprint series or something like that, like that to, to run on Champions Day. So now British Champions Series essentially is a promotional tool, really, isn't it? It's a promotional tool to divert people's attention towards that final day. I'd say so, yeah. And do you think that's the way it'll carry on, or are you looking at ways of trying to enliven people's interest through the year? As you know, I'm, I, I'm we, we try and personally try to, as much as possible, try and get people more involved into racing, whichever way we can. So uh, we try and find um, um, incentives for people to go racing, for people to uh, to enjoy racing. But I, I think the problem, uh, one one personal problem is, I think uh, at the moment the people that are in racing uh, have been left out for uh, the idea of uh, perception of outside um, people watching racing. I think we, uh, for, um, for instance, the, the whip debate that came around, mm -hmm. the um, a lot of a lot of things that you've got to ask people in racing first before you're thinking. But if you, I think, if you do a survey of people that go into the race courses. Um, that are regular race course goers, you'd see they're mostly the same people that go race course to the races rather than new people every time. Why don't you ask them uh, what, what they want to see? It, what, what are you talking about specifically? Uh, in terms of um, uh, regulations coming in from the BHA, from, uh, from the, um, the racing bodies and t towards races. Um, I didn't. Uh, I thought the. Um, do you remember a few years back when they brought in the whip rules uh, the day before uh, Ch Champions, Champions Day? Day? Yes. Do you think that was a clever idea to do? I think that the 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 timing of it. Chief executive who came in subsequent to that, and essentially not reversed decisions, but tinkered with the whip rules after a significant review, accepted then that they they'd made an error with the timing. But mm -hmm. I'm not sure that anyone in the sport believes that that regulations shouldn't always be looked at and reviewed as long as they're put in place on the back of a of a data-driven study which is what they did with that whip review in in 2011 i mean i think the bha have have administered the uh, the whip rules quite successfully in the last few years which is why i always say to them what champion your own successes True. on the on the whip issue rather than rather than saying oh uh, i think we're doing this wrong i think they're doing i think they're doing quite good work on that, it no that was a that was a, a balls up they yeah and also uh, last year's champions day uh, i mean uh, did, did, did you do you remember when i had two horses in uh, the qe2 and I had uh, Andrea Zini uh, jocked up on one of my horses, and uh, uh, about less than 24 hours before the race, we get a phone call saying, oh, actually, he's not eligible to be riding in the race. Because there was a mix-up surrounding the reciprocity of a ban that he'd received in France. I mean, it was the, the French authorities had banned him yes. in the first instance, but, but initially the BHA had told him that the reciprocity didn't apply, and then they realized that it did. So it was Do, a is that system a, error. Is that a good thing to the owners? Is that a good thing to the races? 
I think I think uh, I, I, we we ended up not having a jockey that is uh, available uh, that day because we had to go and find somebody else. Th they're all taken up. I had other jockeys that go, go uh, were going to ride. I think there's th there has been a lot of mistakes lately by the BHA, and I think they should really uh, be accountable for their mistakes. I mean, I think they've admitted the mistakes that admit admission of mistake mentioned. is not is not the same yeah. as accountability. Exactly. So you can't you can't just admit that you've made a mistake and that's it. I think they have to I'm very uh, I'm very happy that there's a new chairman uh, into the BHA and I I hope she she's going to do a great job. I think she needs to look through all the uh, the uh, the people under her and see what they've done and say yes, this is uh, this is right, this is wrong. We cannot uh, as uh, one, uh, as Andrea Zini said, uh, which uh, is a funny quote, but he's right. He says, "When we make a mistake, we get banned, but when the BHA makes a mistake, they just say, 'I'm sorry.' Is that fair enough?" So you think there should be more accountability? Is yeah. this a, is this a heads will heads must roll speech? No, Sheikha, no, no. I'm not saying heads must roll, but I'm saying there should be a system where everyone is accountable. If trainers make a mistake, they get fined. If jockeys make a mistake, they get fined and banned. If, uh, if the BHA make a mistake, they say, I'm sorry. Where, where I would say, I mean, I, I'm not disagreeing with the idea that the BHA needs to be accountable, any mm -hmm. ruling body needs to be accountable, yep. and we've, we've held a lot of their senior personnel, or I've attempted to hold some of their senior personnel to account on this program. Nick Rust being yes. on the show, David Sykes has been on the show. Um, I have seen Brad that. Brad Dunshay's yeah. been on the show. Uh, and a recent example would be when uh, one of their judges made significant error at, at Sandown. He is no longer uh, employed by, by the BHA. That's probably all I can say because I think it's probably still uh, in, a, in an appeals process. But I think that is an example of the fact that a mistake has been... But it happened in Windsor again. It happened in Windsor, not again, sorry. It happened in Windsor before where a judge was uh, giving, uh, uh, giving his uh, point of view before the photo finish. How easy it, is it just to say, actually, no, don't give a judge. Uh, you're not allowed to just call it. Just look at the photo. Double check your uh, thing. It's, it'll only take two more minutes or three more minutes to, to do that. Like simple ideas, uh, going to the race course and letting horses that aren't the, uh, the right horses run in the races. It happened in uh, Sabal, and then it happened again. When when we were told it will never happen again, there will be checks, there will be uh, monitors uh, where they'll ID them, and we won't see that again. I think three weeks after that or two weeks after that, it happened again. How close? How close have you been off the back of this sort of frustration to saying I, I'm, I, I don't really want part of this? I, it's, the only, the, this is a big problem going forward, and if it doesn't get better. How can we attract people into the sport? I'm sorry. Uh, how, when, I, when every other jurisdiction uh, are doing better, uh, have uh, more consistent rules, um, have uh, less uh, mess-ups into race days, into race courses, uh, into jockey bookings, into um, whip uh, debates, into a lot of things. Santa Anita, as you've seen, they've, they've stopped uh, LASIKs and they're they, want, they wanted to try, I think, no whips or something like mm -hmm. that. But they've gone around doing it the right way. Well, that's... A little bit. That's arguable, and there is no harmonisation of regulation no, in but, the US. But, but what they, they have done in the last week is yes. the major racetracks have finally got exactly. together and no LASIKs. put forward a, 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 the a idea time frame exactly, for, which, which is hard. for no LASIKs. But it, in America, it's much difficult, as you said. In America, each, um, each state has its own mm. laws. Mm. We're in the UK here. We're supposed to have one law. It should, it should be much easier. But your issue is not with... with Harmonization. Your issue is with a, 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 a series of, of significant errors yes. yeah. occurring in a number of regulatory True. areas. True, and uh, ha the errors that are, have happened, I think, c shouldn't happen. In terms of, uh, if this was any other sport, I don't think it would have happened. Let me let me talk to you about your own horses. Okay. Um, I mean, we can, we'll come back to this later. Yeah, no, no, I'm, but I, I'm, I'm happy to talk with you about whatever you want to I, talk about. I, 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 do, I know people will want to know 
about some of your successes, some of the bumps along the road, how you've reached the point that, that you've reached at, at the moment. Um, if you look back over the last decade, what's been the single best thing you've done as a racehorse owner? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, I think employing uh, a team that I trust, uh, led by David Redvers, I think that's the, the best thing I've done. I think he's one of my best advisors. We don't uh, uh, agree on everything at the end of the day, but uh, I think he hasn't uh, led me wrong yet. Uh, um, he looks after most of the, our racing uh, um, empire. And together we've done, we've come up to where we have. I think that's, uh, I think uh, having him as my right hand man was uh, one of the most important things. Have you enjoyed the process to get where you, to work, get where you, you are now? Have you enjoyed the sort of, a, a slight element of trial and error about yeah. it? I have, actually, I have enjoyed every part of it. And um, there has been lean years, as you know. We've had a few years that we didn't have winners, but winners isn't everything. It's about how you go about um, improving yourself and adjusting things. Um, I think we've got a good base of trainers now that we've whittled down. We had a lot of trainers. I think we had too many horses at one stage. Uh, I like to know my horses mm. a bit more individually, personally, rather than just numbers. It is a numbers game, but at the same time, quality uh, outweighs the numbers. I've changed the system now where we're going to uh, breed more of our own stock, mm -hmm. um, good stock to, to race, rather than just buy them. But everyone, uh, everyone starts, you have to buy horses to build up your base. We've done that in the last 10 years, and now we're just cherry picking what we have to do. Uh, do you think you have to do a number of different things? You've been quite experimental in the way that you've operated occasionally. And I talk, David's been on the program, and I talked to him about it. And you, yeah. Occasionally you've gone into the breeze ups hard, sometimes you haven't. Occasionally you've used this many trainers, now you're using slightly more, uh, so obvious is the wrong word, but slightly more yeah. established top-notch trainers like the Goslins and the Stouts and the Haggises and so forth. Sure. Um, could you have got to this point without having done all the other bits and pieces, if you see what I mean? Um, if you ask, uh, if you ask somebody, they'll tell you yes. But if you ask somebody else, they'll tell you no. For me, I think no, because I'd li I like to to experiment through everyone, through uh, through different trainers. I've learned a lot of methods from trainers that uh, aren't with us at the mo at the moment that are good uh, good methods. Mm -hmm. I've learned uh, that uh, you can't just uh, go to the breeze ups and say, okay, I'm going to buy uh, the top uh, five breeze up horses and think uh, I'm going to have. Uh, 10 grade one winners, it doesn't happen that way. You can't go to, and also I've learned going to the yearling sale and buying the most expensive horse in the <laughs> yearling market <laughs> to becoming a good horse. It doesn't happen that way. It's, it's all about um, uh, having um, something that you look for in a horse, in a pedigree, in, uh, uh, and you have to uh, source them from all the sales, from all the breeding stock, that you have to go through everything and then just try and pick your, pick your, pick your ways. But Racing should not be judged on one year's uh, crop. No. I'll come to Roaring Lion in a minute, because it would be very remiss of me not to give him a pretty <laughs> decent shout out. Uh, but you talk about buying horses at the sales. You are still going in. You're still getting stuck in. And if you are going to get stuck in, you're going to get stuck in for a good horse with a nice pedigree, like this one here, um, who you bought last back end. And this is the brother to... Uh, too darn hot. Too think. darn hot. Do far we out of Dar Daremi. Now, how's this horse getting on? He's, he's well, actually. I went to see him um, two days ago uh, at uh, John's yard, and uh, he, he, he's, he's doing well. He's doing everything right. Um, as you know, he's with a master trainer. I'm not going to tell John what to do with him. He's going to tell us <laughs> what to do. And he knows what he's doing. Um, the horse is fine. He's great. Um, I see him more... Uh, as uh, his sister's ra his sister rather than too darn hot. Mm -hmm. to do, so you see him more as a staying prospect. Yes, um, he, he's he's slightly a bigger individual than uh, too darn hot. Uh, he might take a bit more time to see the race course than too darn hot did. In terms of, um, I think he was out in July, wasn't he? Mm. Uh, I think we'll see we'll see him midsummer and summer this horse. So we'll I'm at the moment touch wood. Everything is going well. And. You say, I, I'm not going to tell John Gosden what to do, he knows what he's doing. How much input do you like to have with your trainers? Do you ever ask them, look, please could you run here, or 
we we all we have discussions even with John I'll have a discussion um, I remember uh, going back to Roaring Lion when he won the Dante and uh, we had to we had uh, you know I had to have a discussion with John afterwards I rang him up uh, I, I, unfortunately I wasn't there because it was Ramadan and there was mm. fasting so I uh, rang him up uh, that evening and um, he said to me uh, well he won the Dante by uh, I think it was six lengths or, so, or something like that, and he, was, he hit the line um, uh, well. I said, he said to me, what do you want to do with him? I said to him, well, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we love British racing, and if we do have a derby horse, uh, I'd be very happy to run him in the derby. If, he, if you think it's the right thing, he said, let's wait and see what he tells us in the next few days. And in fairness, the horse came out well out of the race. He looked well. Um, Oshin, want, Oshin wanted to give him a chance as well. We all, I think we were all in the same boat of trying um, the Derby, and as you watched, I think uh, the Derby was won by a brilliant horse, Massa. But uh, there was <laughs> at the two pole there, there was a bit of uh, uh, flutter that uh, he might actually go and uh, do it, but it's just his stamina didn't uh, last um, last him to to the line. Uh, how excitable do you get? I I got better watching races I think my mother used to tell me you, you she said to me you should stop uh, buying race horses or having race horses if you're gonna get this uh, anxious watching the horses so I've, I've got much better now calmer watching races than I used to be I used to get a little bit uh, overexcited when when you were in the box with with Her Majesty the Queen and Roaring Lion won the QE2 just have a little look down here <laughs> am I right in thinking you were trying to hold it in and she urged you to let it out. She said, she, she, Her Majesty said to me, you've got to enjoy this. Uh, so uh, she said to me, she said to me, enjoy this one when we were at the two poles. So uh, I had to basically uh, let it out a bit. I hope I didn't make a, much of a mess, of, a mess of it. She seemed to be enjoying it as much as you were. I think she was. She, 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 is, she is one of the um, big, uh, one of our biggest supporters in terms of um, myself. She helped me uh, into racing a lot. Uh, every time I've met her, she's, uh, I've learned something new about racing. Uh -huh. I've learned something better to, 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 to do in racing. So she's encouraged us uh, very much uh, in terms of uh, how to um, improve our operation even. It strikes me you don't have, you're not the sort of person who would have too many regrets. You're, you're quite happy to try and fail if, if you need to. Yeah, every, every, failure only helps you uh, learn more and learn to become better. If you, there's no, we're all, we're all human, everyone makes mistakes. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, not winning a race is not a failure really it's just uh, it's, 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 it's a pathway to uh, hopefully better things but just coming around to where we started when you were growing up and you were saying your father had all these arabians and they basically won every race you went to the races expecting to win yeah when you've had a pretty gilded existence in your youth and you come to a sport like this uh, how long did it take you to realize that things weren't going to come that easily uh, i think very quickly, <laughs> very quickly. And how, how did you take it? Uh, very good. I, th I think it's very good because I've, I've watched racing and I've known that uh, racing in Britain is completely different to what we have in Qatar in terms of racing in Qatar. Um, here you've got more horses, the quality is much better, different racetracks. Uh, and that's the joy of this sport. If you can, if, if, if it's one person that can win everything and it's easy to win everything with, then why are we in this sport? I, wa I want to ask before we take a break uh, again uh, about your own personality and what I perceive as a bit of a total immersion personality. Well, you've ridden in charity races. Uh, you've you shed a load of weight to do so as well. Um, you've supported all sorts of racing ventures, charities. You sponsor races. You own a bunch of horses. You breed a load of horses. You do it all around the world. Is that you? Are you just a bit of an all-or-nothing character? If you're going to go in, are you going to go in and do it everywhere and everything? Well, it's the, if you love something, you have to give it to your all. And I love racing. I love racing in Britain. It's our, it's our base of racing. So, yes, I, will, we, I've, I have given it all, and I will try and give it all as much as I can. Um, I enjoy it, and I think as long as I'm enjoying it, I'll, I'll be doing that. For the moment, Sheikh Farhad, thank you very much. Thank you. Sheikh Farhad Al Thani, who will be rejoining me after this break, when I'll also be joined once again by James Willoughby and Neil Channing. And we'll be talking a little more Roaring Lion.